This is Mongolian Mindset, and today we're going to be responding to uh, one of the comments. Fire acquisition, can you type Bill Gates? So we'll go check him out. Um, let's see what we get. So personality database, our sworn enemy, um, aka the Clown Gate, um, has Bill Gates as an INTP, uh, and they're close with ENTJ. So I'm going to read some of these comments here. Someone says he's an INTJ according to chat GBT. Um, Someone in the community says, Power Hungry Nerd, INTJ. Uh, people show ENTJ with being Power Hungry, and if you are Power Hungry, you will get people typing you as ENTJ, regardless of anything else about you. Unless you don't like don't like you, then you, you're ESTJ. <laughs> ENTJ has become the type to represent this boss archetype that people strive to be and idolize. When it actually has nothing to do with what the type is supposed to represent. ENTJs are most likely to be CEOs, but that is because they are generally focused, responsible, consider multiple creative ways to tackle problems. So this is not an any only thing, not blinded by emotions and don't shy away from networking. So I'm gonna answer that question. I think ENTJs are most likely to uh, be CEOs. It, it, it boils back down to um, what ENTJs are lacking. So. ENTJs are lacking a sense of self, so they go out and try to accomplish things in the outer world to fill that void. Um, by getting achievements, um, they can feel good about themselves. So that's why they usually go for CEO positions. <clears throat> but uh, another person says, INTJ, a genius will show off his power to jump over a chair on the show. He has a history of speeding. He often quarreled with his parents. He's been using a lot of bad language to his men. Okay, someone says ENTJ, INTP, um, INTP, um, a high IQ messiah complex, power hungry ENTJ with fierce teeth, deluded, misguided, NI inferior, very poor developed FI and SI blind spot. Okay, so we're gonna, we, we gonna look it up. We're we, we gonna look into it and we're we gonna see what really goes down. Um, but yeah, um, the chart here, the chart. Um, so the chart had, what well, they have as INTP with barely enough votes, ENTJ is right there. Um, I know a lot of people think he's an ENTJ or INTP, so let's break this down. Um, ENTJs have direct language, so that means they're gonna be specific, concise, and to the point. Um, INTPs are informative, okay? ENTJs are TFI users, so you're gonna be talking about achievements, uh, what's important to them. Um, and uh, INTPs are TIFE users, so they're gonna be talking about logical consistencies. Um, that they're gonna really care about understanding, okay? They're gonna really be caring about understanding why as a ENTJ um, primarily cares about uh, effectiveness, okay? Productivity, that's what TI is all about, okay? TI is all about understanding at the root, okay? And then there's FE, understanding others, um, and what they value. So that's what the uh, INTP is gonna be looking at. They're also informative, okay? And they're responding, okay? ENTJs are initiating, okay? And uh, they're both outcome focused, they're both systematic, and they're both, uh, they're both pragmatic, they're both abstract. So we're gonna be looking for those differences if we think he is one of the two, but we will see. <clears throat> Let's get into this. And we are still doing typing sessions. Uh, all you have to do is uh, message, join our Facebook group and message um, Cody with your availability and we'll try to get that done. Um, some people are charging upwards to 500 bucks for typing sessions. We're doing that free, so go ahead and get that done and join our group. It's a self-development group. Um, it's all about making yourself better. Um, I post things about supplements. I post workout stuff. You're free to ask me anything um, stock related. I've been investing since 2017. Um, when it comes to gym, I've been lifting for 14 years. Uh, so um, wealth and knowledge there. Um, so if you, you know, you feel free to ask me anything, man. Uh, but let's get into this. And please do subscribe. That does help us grow the channel and that helps us grow the group. And that's what we're all about.
Larm again this morning. His new book, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, is out today. It's also been a year of upheaval in his own life after he and Melinda, his wife of 27 years, announced their divorce one year ago today. So, Bill, we have so much to catch up on. It's good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. Well, I, I think this is the definition of what they call a hard sell. You're, you're out here promoting a book, How to Prevent the Next Pandemic, and you know people are sick and tired of hearing about the pandemic. Uh, they have COVID fatigue. Why you know, that, you know, you know, that's a T.E. statement from her. This the moment to have this conversation. Well, I don't want us to wait uh, until we forget about how awful this has been. I mean, we've had tens of millions of deaths. Okay, tens of millions of deaths. That's the outcome. Okay. So we put a point down for outcome. Tens of millions of deaths. You know, trillions of dollars of economic loss. Trillions of dollars of economic loss. That's the outcome as well. Education loss meant... Education loss, outcome, this guy's outcome. Until depression. Uh, and with a few key steps, we can make sure this won't happen again. There's something strangely... With a few key steps, we can make sure this never happens again. That's like the biggest fucking outcome um, thing ever, okay? So, stop that. Optimistic about this book. You've got a whole bunch of ideas on how to actually prevent the next pandemic. One idea, you, you compare it to firefighters. We need kind of a global firefighting team that's ready to uh, find the next pandemic and respond to it. How would it work? Well, in firefighting, we're all trained to know that, you know, there's the exit. Uh, we, the U.S. alone has over 300,000 full-time firefighters. So we take it seriously because if one house burns down, it can, uh, you know, affect an entire community. So that's systematic right there. He's talking about the systematic point of view. One house burns down, it can affect everything else, okay? Pandemics are even worse, and we didn't practice we weren't ready to go. A few countries that were more ready, uh, like Australia, have 10% the deaths that we have. So 10% uh, is the deaths that we have. I'm gonna say that's outcome again. That closes off the board on the outcome for this guy already. Okay, Bill Gates is outcome focus. That means he's looking at the end product. So let's look at the chart here. Um, he's outcome focused. So with that being said, he can only be an introvert or a structure type. Structure types are direct outcome. Um, the background types or uh, yeah, background or behind the scenes um, are informative. So let's go look and see what we got here. So that eliminates all of the progression types. That means the ESFP, um, ENFP, ENTP, ESFJ, INTJ, INFJ, um, INTJ, and ISDP are gone because he's not progression. Okay, Bill Gates is outcome. He wants that juicy outcome, baby. Uh, the debate about exactly how to invest in that preparedness now is the right time, even though we're still trying to get out of this one. Yeah, you've argued that basically pandemics, um, d disease is inevitable, but pandemics are not. And if you spend billions now, you save trillions later. Is that a pretty good summary of the book? Oh, that's outcome there. You spend billions now, you spend... Yeah, so yeah. Tell big, me, big return. Tell me about, um, you, you have this germ team that you propose. We have the World Health Organization. Why isn't that enough? Well, they're not funded, actually, uh, to go to countries and practice. They're not funded to fly in when there's an outbreak. Uh, so they need... Okay, he's spitting facts here. That's T.I. They're not... That's T.I. Building a year, 3,000 more people that would stay dedicated to pandemics. You know, pandemics don't come very often, so it's easy to, to take your personnel and go work on other things. And here, we'd make sure that this team had those skills and was always practicing. By the way, in some ways, we were lucky with this pandemic. It certainly could have been a more contagious virus and it could, could have been more lethal. Yeah, the lethality uh, you know, ends up being about 0.3%. Uh, smallpox is 30%. So. This is not the worst case, all the more reason. That's some TE. I'll give him some TE there. Uh, statistics. To make these investments in preparedness. When you look at how the U.S. and the world responded to COVID-19, whether it's masks or vaccines or shutdowns, closures, it's become so political. I wonder if, if it happened again, if it was March 2020 all over again with COVID-19, would we even be able to mount as effective a response as we did last time around? It's been so politicized. Yeah, it's unfortunate that uh, 
we didn't get trusted voices in both parties talking about the benefit of masks and vaccines uh, so that it wasn't a political issue. I think everybody does support outcome as well. Support the health workers who were heroes. Uh, I think they support the innovation where we got the vaccine out faster uh, than ever before, and that has saved millions of lives. Even that vaccine, we can make a better one where you never get infected. Uh, uh, so, you know, innovation. I'll come as well. Uh, like in many areas, is where I see a potential for a consensus and for avoiding most of the damage. Yeah, the book, if you want to geek out on some of the innovations mm -hmm. and where the technology is, a vaccine you can inhale, a pan vaccine, it's in there. But let's talk about misinformation because that has been a hallmark unfortunately of this pandemic president biden rather famously said last july that misinformation on social media is killing people do you agree yes. absolutely i mean uh, there's going to be a war on misinformation in the future I swear to god with the the rise of podcasts and things like that man you have to really know your information or you're gonna get fucked out here uh, it's been weird that you know, vaccines have been attacked as, you know, being overall net negative or there's some conspiracy here. It's terrible. Well, some of it affects you. You're, yeah. you're part of these conspiracy theories. That is a very weird thing that just because I support vaccines to save millions of lives, people are saying, no, I, you know, you know, I make money from vaccines or that I'm trying to, you know, cause death or track or uh, a lot of strange stuff. Um, hard to understand why that is. Well, you know, hard to understand why that is as a TI statement. Information is obviously a big issue that a lot of folks like you are worried about. Elon Musk just recently announced moves to acquire Twitter. I wonder if you are concerned about the proliferation of misinformation, given some of his views about expanding what he refers to as free speech on Twitter and what you think of the acquisition. Well, the digital realm has facilitated, you know, kind of interesting but wrong ideas spreading very quickly. And we need to innovate so that digital okay. realm... Okay, Bill, you're coming off informative, okay? You just walked straight out of that question, buddy. You're coming off informative here. Go back. Well, the digital realm has... ...of misinformation, given some of his views about expanding what he refers to as free speech on Twitter and what you think of the acquisition. Well, the digital realm has facilitated... Oh, well, the digital realm has facilitated. Let me go ahead and brief you with that, that extra information. You know, kind of interesting but wrong ideas spreading very quickly. And we need to innovate so that digital realm is more of a positive thing of getting the truth out and that people are seeing, hey, this is false. Do you worry um, about Elon Musk? Well, Elon, uh, you wouldn't want to underestimate Elon. What he did at Tesla is amazing, helping with climate change, what he did at SpaceX. Uh, you know, will he this time uh, make that improvement? You know, should there be laws that strike a better balance of uh, free speech versus, you know, conspiracy theories confusing people? Um, you know, Elon thinks he can improve Twitter? Well... I don't, I don't know. Talking about what Elon thinks that's TE. Specifically what it'll do, but, uh, you know, it, it, it is, uh, there's an opportunity and we need innovation in that space. Well, let's talk about you personally. It's been a period of transition. It was actually one year ago today that you and your wife, Melinda, filed for divorce. How have you been coming to terms with this? Well, the divorce is definitely a, a sad thing. Uh, you know, I have responsibility for causing a lot of pain to my family. Um, you know, it was a tough year. I feel good that uh, all of us are moving forward now. You know, my oldest got married. Uh, Give a lot of information here. My boy sweating. Bill sweating up there. <laughs> Go back to the question. My buddy sweating up there. This is definitely a, a sad thing. Uh, you know, I have responsibility for causing a lot of pain to my family um causing a lot of pain to my family that's an fe there buddy okay you know it was a tough year i feel good that uh all of us are moving forward now you know my oldest got married uh melinda and i are did nobody ask you about did your, your oldest get married it's giving us extra information 
continuing Forming. to work together. So, um, you know, it, it was sad and tragic, but, uh, you know, now we're, we're moving together. Yeah, she did an interview recently, and she talked about times in her marriage. She said she was lying on the floor crying. Ooh. Um, what was it like for you to hear that and to hear it publicly? Well, th this was a, a very tough thing. We had a, a lot of amazing things in our marriage, the kids, the foundation, uh, the enjoyment we had. Uh, and so it's a very hard adjustment. Uh, you know, I know divorces are different, but, uh, you know, just a complete change. You know, we were partners. We kind of grew up together. Um, and now that that's different. We're not married. Frankly, there were allegations of extramarital affairs. And when she Woo! was asked about that in the interview, she said, that is a question that Bill needs to answer. So here you are now. <laughs> <laughs> are you unfaithful in your marriage? Is that one of the reasons there was a divorce? Good luck, Bill. I certainly made mistakes, and I, I take responsibility. I don't think delving into the particulars at this point is, is constructive. But, yes, uh, I um, caused pain, and I, I feel terrible about that. Bruh is getting what informed of AF. Okay, okay. Bruh just got informed of AF there. Okay, Bill. Whoo. Learned. From that, I mean, you were someone Sweat. with a voracious appetite for knowledge, and divorce is an experience that can be um, a journey to learning something about yourself and change. Hopefully, what have you learned about yourself? Mm. Uh, you know, they, there's areas like climate or you know health where I I have expertise, and on personal matters like this, I I'm. You know, I, I don't think of myself as an expert. I uh, should be very humble about, you know, success, uh, you know, has a, a tricky aspect to it. That's more T-I-F-E right there. Very humble. Um, so, you know, I don't, I don't have great advice for other people. Yeah. Um, I have to ask you about Jeffrey Epstein. Melinda, Melinda mentioned that that was one of the strains, your relationship with him. And, um, you know, why? I guess the question is real simple. I mean, why did you continue to meet with him? When you met him, he was already a convicted sex offender. Yeah, um, you. you know, and do you regret that? I certainly made a huge mistake, uh, not only meeting him in the first place, but uh, I met with him a number of times. Uh, I had a goal of raising money for global health. I had. He's busting them eyes like, like SI can only do. Okay, he, SI any. Come on. I didn't realize that in a meeting with him almost downplayed uh, the incredibly awful things he did. You know, I learned more about that over time, but uh, you know, I'd add that to the list of big mistakes, including you know where Melinda's advice was sound, and I. I should have followed it sooner than I did. And you never saw anything where you thought, this doesn't feel right. Linda kind of had a visceral reaction the first time she met him. No, he was a, a bad person. Uh, mm. And, you know, uh, I had a reason that I thought those meetings would lead to something good, but uh, I shouldn't have done them. And finally, on this topic, you recently gave an interview and you said you'd marry Melinda all over again. Um, she says you guys are friendly. Um, oh, he made Bill cry. Friends, but friendly. How do you see the relationship moving forward? Well, one of the things we built together is is the Gates Foundation, and we love that work. Uh, you know, we've got all the resources I was lucky enough to get. We've got Warren Buffett uh, committed uh, massive resources, and so making sure that is spent well, saves lives. Melinda and I love doing that work oh, together, cool. so I feel very lucky that I, I still have that with her, as well as, you know, we've got these three incredible kids. I know, and I heard they're all moving out of the house, so you're you're an empty nester for sure now. I've got a big empty nest. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Bill, thank you so much. Thanks for being with okay, us. And again, the book is called How to Prevent the Next Pandemic. Chuck? Let's go. All right, so we got... <coughs> My boy Bill, the sweat. Let me go to a young one. My boy, the sweating boy. Woo, I feel bad so, for you. So, here we are again. Um, 
your picture has been on the cover of virtually every major news magazine. You've written up in all the papers. And for years and years, it was Bill Gates, the boy wonder, the man America loves to admire, the man everybody wants to be. Now all your press is Bill Gates, the man everybody hates, everyone wants to gang up on. What happened? Well, I don't think it's accurate to say there's been a... Uh, well, dramatic. I don't think it's accurate. There's a T.I. for your ass right there. Let's keep going. Like shift. Within our industry, we've been very successful, and we've set Within a lot of Within our industry, standards. we've been very successful. That's how come. And it's had a lot of great products, and it's a very competitive industry, and you're, so you're seeing a lot of reaction to that. But in terms of, of uh, the publicity and the broad acceptance of the direction we're taking, I think it's it's more positive now than it's ever been. What about the ability to separate what Bill Gates has done with Microsoft from what Bill Gates is? Do you think that there's a lot of a lot of sort of stuff that falls over in the wrong direction, maybe? Well, I'm I'm capable of separating them. <laughs> That's the most important thing. Uh, the press, they're not very capable of that, but you know, maybe that's that's not important to them. You worried about the FTC thing or concerned about it at this point? Any investigation like that can take a lot of time. Uh, the amount of paper we'll eventually send to them will be millions and millions of pages. And uh, since since we've been talking to them, they've initiated investigations to into three or four other companies in the industry. Um, and so they're obviously learning a lot about the industry. It's not something we expect to, to change our business, but it, it is a distraction. Good. Now that we got that out of the way, let's go into some fun stuff. Do you remember the first time you saw or used a computer? Do you remember your first instance? Sure. Tell me about it. Well, I was 13 and uh, some money had been donated to get a timesharing terminal. Uh, it was a General Electric uh, computer at the other end. We had a teletype with a modem. And so people were trying to figure out how to use the thing. And, Myself and a friend, Paul Allen, uh, got involved and, and started writing programs. Did you know that? Where the hell was the journey there? There was no journey at all. But he just jumped straight to the outcome. Did you know then that that's where you wanted, you know, to just say, gee, this is where the world is going? Well, at a very young age, I was heavily involved, you know, for long periods, working day and night on the machine, writing programs, learning new things. I'd go through periods where I'd say, hey, this is computer stuff, uh, let's, let's not do that for a little while, then I'd go back into it. And when I went to college at Harvard, uh, I was still dealing with that, am I going to work on this computer side or maybe I'll just go be a work in economics or law and do what I thought of as a more normal uh, pursuit. Uh, so I was always mixing back and forth, and it wasn't really till I dropped out and started Microsoft that I declared where my focus would be. When you got that, that phone call from IBM... He's responding. He's responding. In both interviews, Bill Gates is primarily responding. So if he's responding, I'll come. I mean, he's informative. And we kind of noticed that he's informative here. Um, so, I'll come and responding. <clears throat> and informative... We are down to the background types, ISFJ, um, ISFP, INTP, and INFP, okay? Um, with that being said, let's keep going. It seems like he's a TI user, so if he's a TI user, we'll be down to ISFJ and INTP, and we'll just need to see, is he abstract or not? However, that finally transpired where they said, you're it, we're going to use your system on our new personal computer. Did you have any sense that this was sort of day one of a revolution? Well, it really wasn't. You've got to understand, we'd been in business and we were the, the first in the business, the largest in the business at that point in time. Uh, our system software, our basic was being used on virtually all the machines. Um, when IBM first came to us, they had proposed an 8-bit machine, which wouldn't have had any impact at all. It was 
uh, are suggesting that they move up, take the opportunity to move up to a 60-minute machine, which kind of contradicted the purpose of the project, which was just to prove that IBM could get something done quickly. Uh, they didn't have a very big forecast for it. And we actually had more people working on the project throughout that project. You got much extra information you give me. Uh, even though we were a 30-person company than, than IBM did. Um, and it had to go through all these reviews, and they could cancel the product at any time. And particularly this idea of using a 16-bit processor, there was some real resistance because it meant we had to write new, new things um, to get the work done. And uh, so it had, it had its ups and downs. Once it got done, we chose to use that as the model to go model, a systematic. Go to other manufacturers and promote the idea of using our operating system and being compatible. Obviously, it's got systematic, but we got to get these systematic points. And so we, we saw that as the beginning of, of true compatibility between these desktop machines. When you first got into it, when you first started Microsoft, what did you envision as the future of personal computing? Did you see a paperless office coming, a computer in every home, uh, an information mm. powerful society? What were your views? Well, Paul Allen, my co-founder, and I wrote down uh, that we see a, a computer on every desk and in every home. Uh, we saw the, the microprocessor, the chip that drives it, improving so rapidly that any access to information or processing of information uh, would move uh, into the PC, and it would be the, the tool of the information age. And so that general belief is, is what... Uh, you know, we've been moving towards these these 15 years of those hopes so and promises. Uh, which are the ones that you feel have best been delivered on, and which ones haven't been? Well, the this is an industry where we talk a lot about ease of use and capabilities, and I mean, we still have a long ways to go to make these devices as easy as we'd like. Uh, people's curiosity about the machine and their willingness to learn things and help other users have been really essential uh, to getting the tool to be used as, as broadly as it has. And it's been an industry with a lot of ups and downs. Uh, all of our early competitors uh, went bankrupt. Most of the early outcomes, outcomes. Work companies are gone. Uh, there's been uh, during the 15 years I've been in the business, the number of companies that have come, come and gone have, have been incredible. And it's because a lot of people didn't come up with the right products, they didn't transition to the new stages, and uh, it means it's uh, confusing in history to follow. One of the things that's come out of the industry is vaporware. I understand that, that Ann Winblad actually coined the, the phrase or gets credit for it. Why has this business really sort of almost more than anybody except maybe the electric car business promised more than it delivered or at least uh, promised more on a date in, in terms of delivery. I mean, you've had it with, you had it with uh, Windows 3 in terms of you know, the response when you said it was coming and when it finally came. Was. No, I think you're confused about that. That was announced and, and shipped on the same day. If you want to go back uh, eight years to the initial Windows product, uh, there's a case there, but not with Windows right. 3. But he why lost his ass with TI. Okay, this guy's TIFE. We got enough points for that already. TIFE, so that eliminates ISFP, INFP. Uh, we both, they're both systematic, so we're just looking for abstract, pragmatic um, versus affiliative and affiliative and concrete. Bill Gates is abstract, but we'll keep going until we see something. Why has this sort of been uh, endemic in the industry? And at the end, I'm going to compare him to an actual ENTJ so that people can actually see the difference. It's a world of a difference. Well, I think it, some of it reflects the great interest that users have in knowing when the personal computer is going to get better and more powerful. If you spend hours a day working with the tool, you, um, you like to give input into where it's going to go and, and see how it's, uh, it's going to change. So even when we don't announce products, like Windows, Windows 3 wasn't announced at all, you have a, a set of dedicated publications, or even the business press, going in and taking every testing release you put out, every rumor they can capture, and, and talking about that. So I, I think it's the, the level of interest that drives these things. Um, 
an amount of pre-announcement. Uh, uh, and if you go look in the last two or three years, we've done very, very little of that. Some people are still doing a lot. When somebody gets behind, like say somebody didn't write Windows applications when Windows is taking off, then you get them saying, hey, wait for us, wait for us. Our product's going to be great. And, uh, and we have a quite a, a lot of that right now. Who the fuck is he saying? I couldn't imagine who you might have in mind with that. Um, you know, dis despite your participation in the Advanced Computing Environment Initiative, you're really now the defender of the installed base. You know, you're the champion of the 50 million DOS-based machines. And when guys like oh, Apple course, and yeah. IBM get together and say, you know, we're going to bring you something completely new, and you have to throw out everything you've got, you've sort of become the defender of the guy of, of these 50 million out there. Was that a role that you went after, or has that just sort of happened? And how do you feel about that? Well, the, I think the installed base is the defender of, of itself. The investment people have in learning applications and buying equipment and setting things up is so immense that uh, if anybody puts themselves into the position of attacking that, I think they're making a mistake. Uh, the position of improving it. Certainly we need lots of improvements. And so the real question is, uh, who, can, who can do that job of preserving what's there and, and taking it forward? Because we have built the system software that's used in... Systematic. In the vast majority of those machines, we're in a, we're in a good position. Uh, for example, we provide a graphical interface and I'll be providing a lot of things like handwriting and so-called object orientation as we move forward. So we're in a stronger position to preserve it. But if you listen to people's messages, they're all saying some funny, vague way they'll try and preserve it too because they, they know how, how critical it is. By almost every, every one of the studies I've seen, uh, the Mac is still a lot easier to learn than any of the DOS machines. And some of the studies even say that uh, it's, it's still about uh, half the time to learn applications on a Mac is window apps. That being the case, and I mean, I, I know you produce the on the platform, but that being the case, why don't we have a situation where if the Mac is so much easier to use, they've got 90% of the market and, and the, the IBM and compatible is only 10% instead of the other way around? Was the, what happened that didn't make that happen? Well, first of all, it, it's not just not true. I mean, to learn... Just not true. That's just not true. T.I., correct them. Get the facts Excel out there. on the PC and to learn Excel on the Macintosh, it's the same. Uh, you know, the learning about cells and formulas and how you give commands. Believe Systematic. me, it's the same. Uh, so... What you're saying is it just isn't isn't correct. Ooh, that TI. What you're saying is just not correct. In terms of some of the initial system setup, the idea of having the system software pre-installed has always been an advantage for the Macintosh, and that's why you see a lot of people building Windows into their systems now, more and more. Um, clearly, there's you know the market prefers the DOS machines; they're the overwhelming favorites. Uh, and, and a lot of that has to do with this openness, the competition where hundreds of manufacturers are trying to provide the fastest, the cheapest, the smallest uh, type of machine and the flexibility that provides. And then because those machines are more popular, a lot more software. There's always been tons more software for the DOS machines than any other, other computer Definitely. ever. And that makes a difference. If the package you want is only on the PC, you don't care about uh, what's going on with any other computer? Let's talk a moment. I, okay. He's an INTP, okay? Um, but uh, let's go look at an ENTJ, okay? So, because people on personality database can't tell the difference. Alex Ramazzi interview. Let's go, this guy. Hmm. Let's go for people who are poor it's because they actually don't see reality for what it is because the way they see i'll give you some more feedback but if you just keep asking and you don't act yeah 
we talked about this with a mutual friend we have. It's frustrating for a mentor. They don't want to give you that time. No. And um, I told him, I go, this is why I pay mentors. You yeah. know, there's a, there's a big guy in media that has a, a massive business that I, I messaged him. I'm an yeah. acquaintance with him. I said, hey, I would love to pay you for some coaching. He said, I'll just do it for you for free for 30 minutes. Now, I want to pay him yeah. because I want to be able to do it more frequently. <laughs> yeah, right. He said, I'll give it to you for 30 minutes because he likes me. We're f- friendly. But I know I can't call upon him for 30 minutes every week. Right. So now I'll go back in six months and say, I took action on everything you said in that 30 minutes. Here's our results. Go do another call. Yeah. Oh, and cool. that's kind of like what you can expect with a mentor yeah. is that type of opportunity. Unless you have a serious bond and they just want to give with their time. But investing in it, like you said, is so much more powerful in getting that speed of information, in my opinion. Totally. The single highest return on investment thing I've ever done, and not to sound trite here, but I just like using scenarios. Like if I had taken all the money that I had spent on coaching, mentorships, courses, workshops, seminars, and put that in the S&P 500 when I, uh, you know, 10 years ago, right? The amount that I would have right now is inconsequential compared to what I currently have. Mm. And it's because I invested in something different. So rather than invest- So you see that? See that? Direct outcome right there and hypothetical. You just got an abstract, you got an outcome, and you got direct language from Alex Offer. Investing in the S&P 500, I invested in the S&P 500. So I took all of the excess cash that I had every single month and rather than saying like, oh, I'm at a dollar cost average, you know, I'm long term, I wait four years, whatever. Um, I was like, I just don't make enough money. So like I could be the millionaire next door who saves every penny, doesn't go to Starbucks for my entire right, life and right. have two million dollars when I oh, cool. I'm old or eight, you know, whatever. For the last ten years of my life. Right. And yeah. literally enjoy nothing during that period of time. <laughs> that doesn't sound like this it's not a trade I wanted to make. And so I had a belief that I know I I will work hard and if I'm given the right tools, I will be able to implement them. And so I took all my extra money, and this is kind of, you know, a lot of people might not necessarily agree with me on this, but it worked for me. So I put all of every me. dollar I had, even when in that? debt, to get access to communities and mentors and coaching programs. And, 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 That's and what an ENTJ out. is like, okay? Let's go to another ENTJ, okay? Patrick, Bet David, okay? Let's go, Patrick, Bet David. Okay, let's get it out of here. We had him on the Tom Blue show. I think that additional kind of peer pressure you put into yourself, you're in the right circles, right environments. Those two guys that, you know, put some kind of a peer pressure or direction into you. Look at look really how direct these guys are. Okay. Life, all of a sudden, the identity goes from being a regular person to the next day, no one recognizes them. In the wo- world of social media of influencers, there's some that'll say things like, "Listen, you have a lot of time. Take your time. You're okay. You're gonna be all right. You're gonna be fine. You have a lot of time." And that's fine. That can work for some audiences. And sometimes you wonder if it's almost like a strategy so other people don't catch up to you because they think they're like, honestly, you sit there and say, is this guy really that dark that he's trying to get everybody else to slow down so he kind of, you know, works his ass up. Well, hey, everybody else, you slow down, it's okay. Where for me on the other side is, listen, this never lies. This lies. When I look at my hand this way, I'm 25 years old. When I look at my hand this way, I'm 40 years old. (laughs) We look at our hands too often this way. I like to look at my hands like this. This doesn't lie. This is a 40-year-old wrinkles. This is 40, okay? You got direct I can't lie about that. That's 40 years old. Now, I can look at this and say, no, I'm a lot younger. I got a lot of time. We don't. So, look at for that. me. We don't. Yeah. So, that's what ENTJs look like, okay? Very direct, okay? Uh, our buddy there, uh, Bill Gates, is not. So, let's go to the chart here. Uh, Bill Gates is INTP. He's outcome. He's systematic. He's a TI user. Like he said, like you saw in the interview, he's busting ass with that TI. Um, correct your ass here, correct your ass there. Uh, he's informative, so he's very descriptive, wordy, passive, um, whatnot. Um, he's an SINE user, so he talks from his first person perspective. He's responding, he's introverted, he's abstract, and he's pragmatic, okay? <sighs> yeah, learn the difference between ENTJs and INTPs. 